Welcome back to uh, verse by verse study through the book of Revelation. And today we are in chapter 15. Chapter 15 is the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation. It's only eight verses long, and it's a kind of a it's preparing us for what's fixing to happen, which is uh, we went through the seven seal judgments, the 21 judgments laid out the timeline in the book of Revelation. We went through the seven seal judgments at the beginning and the seven trumpet judgments, and we're about to go into the seven bowl or vial judgments, which are the literal, literally the, the, the next, the seven bowl judgments are, are the wrath of Almighty God poured out upon the earth. Um, it's the final, it's the final seven judgments. And um, they are horrible and they are horrendous. And chapter 15 kind of is kind of a preparatory chapter for that and how it comes about a little bit. And uh, since uh, chapter 15 is only eight verses long, we're, uh, like I said, it's 15 chapters in, there's 22 in the book, so we're getting close to being done. But since I knew this was going to go pretty quick, I wanted to take this opportunity to just kind of go back and, uh, you know, just kind of really briefly go over uh, what we've been through uh, so far. Um, if, if you sit down and when we study this and go through, you know, little by little, week by week, which is, you know, the only way it should be studied. But the thing is, it gets, I mean, we've been at this for several months now. And uh, we're in chapter 15, and, and it's just it's just kind of good to go back and review because you kind of lose track of what all has happened up up until this point. So uh, let's just go over, uh, just kind of review uh, everything that we went through up to this point. Um, chapter 15 brings us to an introduction to the seven living creatures, the Zoe, not and the the, the, the the who hold the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Starting in chapter 16, verse 1, the seven bowls full of the wrath of God begin to be poured out upon the earth. Chapter 15 is the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation, and this is a good time for a short review. The ultimate, I mean, the timeline that threads through the book of Revelation are the 21 judgments of God and the Lamb that come against the earth during what we call Daniel's 70th week, or also known as the seven-year tribulation period. The time of Jacob's trouble, um, it's referred to in, in the Old Testament also. Um, the first seven of these are the seal, S-E-A-L, judgments, followed by the seven trumpet judgments, and finally the seven vial or bowl judgments. The seven seal judgments are described in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 through 17, and uh, chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. The seven trumpet judgments are described in Revelation 8, verse 6 through 13, and chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. And the seven bowl or vile judgments are described in Revelation 16, verses 1 through 21, which of course, Lord willing, will be next week. <clears throat> These three series of end time judgments from God get progressively worse and more devastating as they progress through the seven years of the tribulation period. Remember all this, when we go over this, you know, it's always good to bear that in mind that these things, all these things that take place that we read about that are going on or happening in the book of Revelation, all of them take place within a seven year period. But the majority of them take place within a three and a half to four and a half year period, a very short time span, you know, and then especially looking at it from, from God's perspective. I mean, you know, it's, it's a very short time and all this, these things are pummeling the earth, you know, just one thing right after the other, boom, boom, boom. Um, they get progressively worse and more devastating as they, as they go through the seven years of the tribulation period. The seven seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are connected to one another. This, in other words, the seventh seal introduces the seven trumpets. When, when the seventh seal is broke, that brings forth the seven trumpets. When the seven trumpet sounds, that bring forth, brings forth the seven vials. And... Um, <clears throat> The first four of the seven seals, going all the way back to the beginning, the first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's their, you know, that's their popular name, and whatever you want to call it. One, the first seal introduces the Antichrist, or the 
other Christ or the alternate Christ. Remember that that, that horse is white, and but the man that's on it has got a bow and represents a war, and he's given a crown instead of has a crown. And, and it's, it's the Antichrist, the the false Christ, the fake Christ. Uh, the second seal is warfare. That horse comes out and he represents war. The third seal is famine. Remember that horse comes out and he's got a, a balance in his hand and it represents famine. And the fourth seal comes out, which is the fourth horse, and he brings about plagues, more famine, and war and more warfare. And that's all in uh, Revelation 6. Uh, the fifth seal tells us of those who will be martyred for their faith in Christ during the end times. It's in Revelation, that's nine, verse 9 11 of Revelation 6. God hears their cries for justice and will deliver them in His timing, in His time, in the form of the sixth seal along with the trumpet and the bowl judgments. The sixth of the seven seals is broken and a devastating earthquake occurs, causing massive upheaval and terrible devastation, along with unusual astronomical phenomena. That was in Revelation 6, verse 12 through 14. Those who survive are right to cry out to God. And they cry out and they say, fall on us and hide us. Remember, they cry out to the rocks and they, and they go into caves and they cry out to the mountains to fall down on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? That's Revelation 6, 16 and 17. <clears throat> From the very beginning and all through this, even up to what we'll read tonight, from the, from the very beginning, God has at, at, at certain intervals, He has let man know beyond a shadow of a doubt who is causing this, where all these things are coming from, from Him, and why He's doing it, the judgment upon the earth. Nobody's left blind. Nobody's left uh, unknown. Nobody's walking around on the face of the earth saying, what in the world is going on? There is no question in anybody's mind. If you remember through the book of Ezekiel, 63 times when we went through the 48 chapters of Ezekiel, 63 times in there God announced, 63 or 67, can't remember which now, but He announced to them all why I'm doing this, so that you will know that I am the Lord your God. There's no, there's no question. These people aren't walking around in, in, in this future time. They're not going to be walking around wondering who's causing this, wondering why these things are going on, why are they happening. There's not going to be any, there's no unknown. The people, the earth dwellers, the people that are dwelling on the earth, that are not taken in the rapture, that are having to go through these things, they will know what's going on. They will know where it's coming from, and they will know why it is happening. <clears throat> the seven trumpets are described in Revelation chapter 8, verse 6 through 13. The seven trumpets are the, con are the contents, the seventh trumpet, I'm sorry, is the contents of the seventh seal. The first trumpet causes hail and fire that destroys much of plant life in the world, Revelation 8 and 7. The second trumpet brings about what seems to be a meteor hitting the oceans and causing the death of much of the world's sea life. That's in Revelation 8, verses 8 and 9. The third trumpet is similar to the second, except it affects the world's lakes and rivers instead of the oceans, or in other words, the fresh water, the drinking water, killing all this life in the ocean. All the ships, remember, the, the, the meteor came down and it killed a third of the life in the ocean and it killed a third of the ships on the sea. And then, and then the next one caused the drinking water, the fresh water, the rivers, and, 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 the, and, the, and the, uh, where we get drinking water from. The fourth of the seven trumpets causes the sun and the moon to be darkened. Revelation 8, verse 12. The fifth trumpet results in a plague of demonic locusts that attack and torture humanity. It's Revelation 9, verses 1 through 11. The sixth trumpet releases a demonic army that kills a third of humanity. Revelation 9, verses 12 through 21. And the seventh trumpet calls forth the seven angels with the seven bowls of God's wrath. That's in Revelation 11, uh, 15 through 19, and, and Revelation 15, verses 1 through 8, which we're fixing to get into. Along with the timeline of the 21 judgments of God, now remember, that's, 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 that's your basic timeline. There's 21 judgments that are coming. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials. They go in that order, and that's the basic, that's the 
basic theme through the whole book of Revelation. That's the basic timeline, and, and, and we've talked about that before, that I wanted to establish, a, a, my, one of my uh, priorities was to establish a baseline of when these other things and how to tag these things to it. And it just turns out that I'm just not smart enough to do that. But anyway, along with the timeline of the 21 judgments, the book of Revelation of Christ contains various chapters of instruction and warning of things to come, commonly referred to as parenthetical chapters. We talked about them before. So along with this baseline of these 21 things that are going to happen, there's descriptive chapters all through here that talk about other things that are going on at the same time that do or don't necessarily have to have anything to do with the basic timeline, the basic judgment. All, all of it is going to be meshed together, but it's the, the whole book of Revelation in itself is you got a foundation of these of these 21 judgments that are going to happen one right after the other, and they're going to happen in that chronological order. Now, not so much in chronological order are these descriptive chapters, these other things that talk about, like 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 uh, the, 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 the two witnesses or chapter devoted to two witnesses, a chapter devoted to the 144,000. All these things are going on at the same time and are connected to or maybe not necessarily connected to the baseline, which is the 21 judgments that are happening in chronological order. Um, chapter 1, John is reintroduced to Jesus Christ, his friend. Remember, there's two men in the Bible that are, that are referred to as beloved. One of them is John, and the other one is Daniel. Both of them had, had apocalyptic visions. Both of them saw the end times. Daniel saw the same thing that John saw. When he, when he saw his visions. Daniel wrote down most of it, but wasn't allowed to publish it. John wrote down almost everything, and it became published. It became what we know as, know as the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of the revealing, the unveiling of these things. So chapter John, chapter 1, John is reintroduced to his friend, Jesus Christ, while in prison on the Isle of Patmos. And Christ announces to John that he will reveal things to him that he has seen, things that are, and things that shall be hereafter, or the things that are going to happen in the future. And that John is to write these things down. In chapters 2 and 3, Christ dictates to John seven letters written to seven specific churches of that day, churches that were functioning churches in that day. These letters are written in such a way as to give specific instructions to these churches, to these churches that were active and, and going on. Those, those letters were written to be read to those seven churches for things that those seven churches were involved in or were not involved in, whatever the case might have been. The letters also stand as instructional and applicable to all the church, which is the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, which is his body, for all time. The seven letters also represent seven church ages. Remember, we went through that study and we studied the seven letters. We studied the application to the churches of the day and the applications to the churches of our, but not necessarily. I didn't go through and with the, the church ages. I, I left that up to you. <coughs> if you decided to um, study that, I hope you was fulfilling. The seven letters represent seven church ages which, uh, which over time the body of Christ have passed through. As the Lord tarries and time passes by, these seven letters are just as vital to the modern day church as they were to the church of the first century when they were first written. Chapters 4 and 5, the church is beckoned to come up hither. Remember chapter 4 and verse 1, that represents the rapture. The church is not represented as on the earth any after chapter 4, verse 1. It's beckoned to come up hither, to come up and see the vision, see the things that are up there. It's come up hither, and the scene of the book changes from earth to heaven. The throne of God is described, as well as the many millions and millions of heavenly inhabitants who worship and serve the throne of God eternally. Christ is called forth and crowned King of all glory. His coronation, and he is handed the scroll that is sealed with the first of the coming judgments, known as the sealed judgments. In chapter 7, a description is given of the choosing and the setting apart of 144,000 Jewish males. 12,000 of these are chosen from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and each tribe is listed. These men are marked with the name 
name of God in our foreheads. They are protected from all the destruction that is about to start coming onto the earth. They are set apart to witness the gospel to those left dwelling on the earth. And chapter 7 closes with a vision of their finished work as a vast multitude of saints standing before the throne of God. In chapter 10, a mighty angel who is Jesus Christ stands on the earth and declares that the wait is over, the end is now, and Christ hands John a scroll and tells him to eat it and it shall be sweet in his mouth but bitter in his belly. In chapter 11, we, need, we meet the two mysterious witnesses, or called the, the two witnesses, the, the final witnesses, the witnesses of God who patrol the streets of Jerusalem, preaching the gospel. And all who approach them or try to hurt them are killed in the same manner that they try to use against these men. And after three and a half years, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the one that we refer to as the Antichrist, he comes along and he comes against them and he kills them and he leaves them laying in the street. They lay in the street for three and a half days. A voice that is heard all over the earth calls them up and they stand up in front of a member. The, the Bible says that everybody on earth is going to see them. We talked about that. It's going to be on TV. There's going to be networks dedicated to them. It's going to be on social media. People are going to be walking around with their phones in their hands watching these two men lay in the street watching them lay there dead and partying and rejoicing and giving each other gifts over the fact that they're finally dead. The world has finally got rid of these two men who just would not die and would not shut up. So they're walking around giving everybody presents and they're watching them. So a voice, after three and a half days, a voice that's heard all over the world announces for them to come up, to come up hither, just like the church was called up previous chapters before and they stand up on their feet and like I said the Bible don't say how long they stand there but I hope they stand there for a good couple of minutes three minutes so every single body on earth will have a chance to understand to learn what has happened and to look upon them and to feel that dread in their hearts a voice is heard all over the earth and calls them up and they stand up and they rise up to heaven much to the dismay of all the earth dwellers <clears throat> in chapter 12 is a summation of the entire history of Israel in the form of a great sign in the sky. A woman who gives birth to a man-child, and the man-child is called up to heaven. A battle ensues, and the, and the great red dragon, which is Satan, is cast out of heaven forever. That's, that's the point in time where he finally, his access to heaven is finally denied for all time. The woman flies off to the wilderness where she is attacked by the dragon and survives with the help of the earth itself. The dragon returns to Jerusalem and he makes war with the remnant, which is the 144,000 who were there spreading the gospel. Because the Bible says he goes and he makes, more, makes war with those who keep the commandments of God, their Jewish part, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, their salvation. Chapter 13, a description of the end time powers that control the earth are described as the satanic trinity. The beast, which is we refer to as the antichrist, his buddy, the false prophet, they come to rise, they come to power at the same time. Remember in chapter 13, the beast rises up out of the, the sea and the false prophet, another beast, which turns out to be known as the false prophet, rises up out of the earth. They come to power at the same time. <clears throat> as far as I can tell, they spend their entire time while they're on the earth together, hand or not hand in hand, but, but helping one another. And then they finally, when they're cast into the lake of fire, they're cast into the lake of fire together. So they come to power together, they stay together, and they get cast off into utter darkness, into outer darkness together. Um, the beast, the false prophet, and the image. Remember the false, the, the false prophet calls for an image to be created. And then he has power to bring that image to life. And he causes that image, the image comes to life and he speaks and he says, anybody who does not worship the beast, which is the man of sin, shall be killed. And in doing that, they have to be marked with a mark in their head or their hand, which is the, 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 the number, the man, his name, the number of his name, or the mark. You get, you get three different choices there. But anybody, he calls for the death, for the slaughter, for anybody who refuses to take that mark. Because like I said, at the end of chapter 13, when it describes the mark of the beast, the first, foremost, and the primary function of the mark of the beast 
is to identify you as a beast worshiper. The buying and selling part, that's just that, that's just a fringe. That, that's just, that goes along with it. Its primary function is for everybody to be able to look at you and see if you are a, worship, a, a worshiper, a worshiper of the beast. And, and it's going to be like, you're, it's going to be like, there's going to be like a salute. It's, if it's not your forehead, it's going to be in your hand. <laughs> and if it's in your hand, everybody's going to be walking around doing these, you know, like pseudo Hitler salutes to each other because you're going to have to raise your hand and salute and show people that you're a beast worshiper. You're going to have to identify yourself. It's going to turn into, it's, it's going to look, it, it's, it's going to be weird. It's going to be what we would see as weird in, in today's society. But as you can see, the way things are going in this election cycle, it's, it's, it, we're kind of headed down that road right now because we're, we got everybody falling lockstep in behind this man who is, who is, it's unbelievable what's going on in the election cycle. I, I, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to get too much into it, but you know, I can see the beginnings right now today. I can, I can see how where we're going is heading down a road where the end of that road is that everybody's going to have an identification mark on their right hand and we're going to turn into a bunch of people who walk around saluting each other and showing each other our identification mark. I can see that has happened before and I, and I can see it happening right now because that's the primary function of that is to identify you as a worshiper of the beast. Chapter 14, a vision of the overview of the series of events that have or will take place on the earth during Daniel's 70th week. A vision of the Lamb, Christ Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, accompanied by the 144,000 chosen ones. A more detailed description of these are found in this chapter. John saw Christ on a cloud sitting, uh, sitting on a sickle which he used to harvest the earth. Another angel was seen with a sickle who was told to harvest the earth for the great wine press of the wrath of God. And an angel announced the fall of Babylon. That's all in chapter 14 and that brings us up to date here in chapter 15. So let's uh, let's just keep going. Just jump right in. Revelation chapter 15, starting in verse 1. And I saw another angel, uh, as, as opposed to the ones that we've met all through that ch chapter 14. I saw another angel, great and mar I, I'm sorry. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. The word seven. The word seven is used in, in uh, the book of Revelation 54 times. There are multiple, multiple more times of, of, of indications of seven, seven things that go on seven that, are, that aren't pointed out. Just like in chapter 14, there's seven announcement angels, seven different angels in there that, that, that make declarations. So the word seven is used 54 times in Revelation. There are many more examples of seven things, but the word is written 54 times. These seven angels are different from the seven trumpet angels who we just got through dealing with. And it is full of, they have, uh, they have uh, they're full of the seven last plagues. Now, all these are God's indig indignation towards the oppressive and persecuting powers of the dragon. That's who he's coming up against. The beast and his image will be completely completed or exhausted by the pouring out of the contents of these vials. That and, and it says, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. That filled up is G. 5055. That's that's the uh, that, that's the Strong's number, and and it means it's translated as finish, eight times, fulfilled seven times, accomplished four times, pay, perform, and expire four times. It means to end or complete, to execute, conclude, to discharge, to accomplish, to make an end of, to fill up, or to finish. That's what he's because uh, that's what this is describing. This is the finish. This is the this is the last one. This is the seven seven worst and and the line as they progress through the seals and the trumpets these are the seven last and they are the seven worst so that they are filled up in other words the finish this is the finishing touches verse 2 and i saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass 
having the hearts of God. Notice these are the ones that got the victory over. They did not succumb to that. They did not give in. They did not accept the mark of the beast. I, I, cannot, I cannot overstate in this because it's not just me being trying to make this emphatic point. The Holy Ghost is trying to make it as well. This is several times now that he's pointed out and made it very, very clear. You cannot take the mark of the beast and receive salvation for it later on. If you take the mark of the beast, that is the total rejection of God, and you have identified yourself as a beast worshiper, and that is your judgment. There, God needs nothing else to judge your life and to deem your existence worthy of an eternity in the lake of fire. That's all he needs. Nothing else that you've done in your life all of it adds up, and we're going to stand in judgment for all of it. Don't get me wrong. But if the only bad thing you've ever done in your entire life is take the mark of the beast to feed yourself or to feed your family, there is no coming back. That's all it takes. That is your judgment. It's not just me trying to point that out. It's been over and over and over here in the book of Revelation. It's announced time and time again where these people get this information that you can take the mark of the beast and then receive salvation for it later on. I have no idea. It boggles my mind that they can read the book of Revelation and still walk away from it thinking that a man can take the mark of the beast and then get saved for it after, later on. It's, it's just, it's just, it's not true. It's just not true. I saw, as it were, verse 2, is a sea of glass. This is the same sea of glass that he saw in Revelation chapter 4 when he was called up. The first thing he saw in heaven, remember chapter 4, John called up. He went through the door that was opened up in heaven, and he saw the throne. He described the throne, and he described that sea of glass that was in front of the throne, and all those multiple millions of people standing around on it. So, so here he's seeing it again. Only this time it's mingled with fire. Now, that could mean, it could mean that the floor is, is literally on fire, but I kind of doubt that. I, I, I've seen several instances lately of people walking across very highly polished, shiny floors and, and well-lit like tele, television studios and things. And if you, if you watch them, if you watch somebody walking across a floor like that and move, moving it, it, those shiny floors and the lights that are in the room, it looks like fire. It looks like flames licking across the floor. So I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking in my mind this 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 sea of glass, which would be extremely shiny, mingled with fire, would be the lights and the things that are going. Because remember, around God's throne, there's always there's always lightning. There's always you know controlled chaos around His throne. Wherever He's at, as a matter of fact, we'll get into that a little later. Wherever God is, is kind of that 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 controlled chaos. There's there's fire, and there's the color of amber, and there's clouds, and there's storms, and there's hail, and there's thunder, and there's lightning, and all these things surround the throne of God. And there's these three these four creatures that stand before Him all day and night forever crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. All these things are going on around God all the time. So it don't, it, it's not, it don't seem strange to me to think that John saw the sea of glass mingled with fire looking at the reflections of the things that are going on. And them that had gotten victory over the beast. Um, these are a representation of the... Uh, A representation of the fulfillment of the fifth seal and, and Revelation 6 and 9 through 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So that's what John is seeing here. He's seeing the fulfillment of that in the end, in the, in the very end, all these that are, that are standing around. <clears throat> And I saw, um, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. 
and on the sea of glass and stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Again, there's, there's no redemption from... I can't say that enough. I, I can't say that. I, I just can't say that enough. Verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not who shall not fear thy name that who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Now, there are three songs recorded in the Bible that are referred to as a song of Moses. The first one is um, found in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 19. I'm going to write that down. The second one is Psalms chapter 90, verses 1 through 17. And the third one is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 43. Now, I'm not going to go through and read all these scriptures. Um, I hope you wrote all that down, and you and I hope that you will go and read these passages. And but and so and all three of these are recorded as songs of Moses. Let me just read a little bit from Psalms chapter ninety, and that's chapter ninety, verses one through seventeen. A prayer of Moses, the man of God, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and say return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up in the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. We, for we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee our secret sins and the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. These songs, all three of these songs are full of praise and worship and the fear of God. All three of them. It does not matter. The Song of the Lamb, of course, in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 13, it says this, And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength 
and honor and glory and blessing, seven of them, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. <clears throat> we talked about that just a minute ago. Every creature on earth is all the way. This is in chapter 5. This is before anything starts out. This is before Christ even received the book. This is when he first received the book that has the seven seals. This is his coronation. This is when he becomes king of all glory. This is when he's crowned king of all glory, before he pops the first seal, before he starts down this road at all whatsoever. Listen to what it was saying there. <clears throat> Every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying every creature everything that's in heaven everything that's alive on the face of the earth man and beast everything that's beneath the earth all those that are in hell and everything that is in the sea what's in the sea fish animals I heard all of these things saying Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now don't you think if you're alive on the face of the earth and you hear the animals around you and the, and, and the animals that are under the sea, if you hear them talking and saying blessing and glory to God in heaven, that's going to give you a clue that everything that happens from here on out is coming from God, it's perpetrated by God, and it's placed on the earth, the judgments I'm talking about, for a reason. Nobody is going to be walking around on the face of the earth saying, what in the world is going on? Nobody is going to be clueless as to why these things that are coming on the earth are coming on the earth. And nobody is going to misunderstand exactly where they're coming from. Everybody's going to understand that, yet men will still reject God. They will still turn their backs on God. They will still shake their fists at the sky and curse God because of the things that are going on, and they will not repent. They will not give up their wicked ways, knowing full well what's going on and what's happening. So it does not matter. It does not matter which of these three recorded songs of Moses that the, the, uh, the DC and Revelation 15 are singing. All three of them, as well as the Song of the Lamb, all speak of triumph and victory and the power and the goodness of God and of His Lamb, Christ Jesus. So it don't make any difference which one they are. And please, please, don't, don't, don't put away and, and, and not go read those through thoroughly. Please read them. Um, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, for just and true are thy ways, thy King of saints. Verse 4. <clears throat> Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. The question is asked here in verse 4, who will not fear God and glorify God and his name? Those that have been martyred during the events that have led up to this point in Daniel's 70th week have certainly proven that they fear God and they glorify him. The ones that are still alive and dwelling on the earth are asked this at this point in time because up till now they have rejected God and repented not of their iniquities. These last seven bold judgments that are about to start are horrible beyond all others so far. The last call to fear God has been announced and it is declared that thy judgments are made manifest or we're about to see them. We're about to see them come. One last warning, so to speak, before everything starts happening. Verse 5, And after I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. This temple of the tabernacle of the testimony, this is the second time that John uh, that has uh, seen the temple, the temple that is in heaven. Remember, that everything we had on earth was a copy. All the things that are on earth are gone now. But the copy, the, the, the original ones that they were copies of still exist in heaven. The temple, the tabernacle that we had on earth is a copy of what's in heaven. The Ark of the Covenant that we had on earth is a copy of the one that's in heaven. All these things that we had on the earth are copies 
of what's in heaven. Now, here's what's interesting about this. <clears throat> he sees this he sees this time this time what is referred to as the tabernacle of the testimony. This is the description of the actual ark of the covenant. That's what he's calling it, the temp, the tabernacle of the testimony. The, the, and and it's called that because the word testimony refers to the tablets that Moses carried down off of the mountain, which are the 10 commandments, the law in other words. So when he says, I see the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony, he's talking about, he's, he's looking inside the temple of God, but he's seeing what he calls the tabernacle of the testimony, which is the resting place of the Ten Commandments. So even the Ten Commandments, the tablets that Moses carried down off of the mountain, are a copy of the original written law that's in heaven. So that ark that's in that temple in heaven apparently contains the original of the law, the original copy of the law that Moses was given at that time. Again, God always knew. I mean, the Bible refers to Jesus in the book of Revelation, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. God always knew what it was going to cost him to save mankind, to, re to reunite, to, to, to form a bridge so that man could return to him. He always knew what that was going to cost. And, and just like with Moses and the law, he always knew what the law was going to be, what the beginnings and the foundations of our faith was going to turn out to be. So here John sees the tabernacle of the testimony inside the temple of God, verse 6. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. These seven angels are seen walking out of the temple, and they have these seven plagues. Remember, we, we talked about this before. These seven hold the last seven plagues, but that word also means wounds and stripes, punishment and judgment. So they have the seven last plagues, or the seven last wounds, or the seven last stripes, or the seven last indignation and judgments of God, of the wrath of Almighty God. And they're carrying it for all those that are it's to be dispensed out. It's, it's, it's direct wrath from the, the throne of God straight to the face of the earth. And these, these angels are portrayed as being clothed in pure white linen, and have, but they're, they have their breasts girded with golden girdles. These, uh, these, these seven are referred to as angels dressed in pure white, which of course represents the righteousness of God and the Lamb. The Levites all wore specific clothing in the carrying out of their various temple duties. <clears throat> all of them wore girdles or waistbands of various colors according to rank and the importance of the duties that they were performing. But only high priests, only the high priests wore a girdle up around their breast. In Exodus 39, verse 20 and 21 says this, And they made two other golden rings and put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath toward the fore part of it. Now remember the ephod was to be worn over the heart. That's why it was worn, it was worn right here. So they made these rings on the ephod toward the, front, toward the fore part over against the other coupling thereof above the curious girdle of the ephod. That is what they wore. The girdle was what strapped the ephod to them. It was strapped to them with a girdle that went around under their armpits. So and what that describes it goes on to describe that the dressing of the ephod and this strap, this girdle that was worn around here under the armpits or over their breasts or over their paps. Remember in Christ, when first when, when John was reintroduced to Christ and his and John describing him the, what he looked like, he described him as having his paps girded with a golden girdle. That's what that represented. The high priest. He is our high priest. So these angels, these angels are actually seven heavenly high priests. They are high priests in heaven. So there's rank, there's pecking order, there's protocol among these angels and these beings that serve and, and stand before Almighty God. But I'm just pointing out here that these seven, these special seven with the last seven plagues, the wrath of God on earth, are literally high priests of heaven that are administering these things. Verse 7, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. These, uh, 
uh, these four these four beasts. Remember the four. These, it's a Zoe. This is not this is not the Therion beast. This is a Zoe beast. These this is one of the four living creatures who stand around the altar that guard the altar in Revelation chapter 4 verse 6 through 8 and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts or Zoe four living creatures full of eyes before and behind and the first beast was like a lion and the second beast was like a calf and the third beast had was had a face as a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Those six wings identify these, these four beasts as cherubim. Cherubim have six wings. Seraphim have four wings. Nothing has two wings. Angels don't have wings. <clears throat> they don't have wings at all. They're not little tiny babies. Angels are not little chubby fat babies. They don't wear diapers. They don't carry bow and arrows around. And they do not, they do not have wings. Only seraphim and cherubim have wings. And one of them has four and the other has six. These six wings identify these four Zoe, these four living creatures that surround the throne of God. It identifies them as cherubim. And they have in their hands the seven golden vials. These vials are hand delivered to the seven angels and the contents of them come directly from the hand of God. They came straight out of the temple. Where these seven angels, these seven angels came out of the temple. They walked, John was looking into the temple and these seven angels, these seven heavenly high priests, they came walking out of the temple. They're delivered to the seven angels, and the contents of them come directly from the hand of God and straight to the earth. Up to this point, the various things that have come on the earth have been delivered by various different persons or, or things or beings. These last seven plagues contain the undiluted, full force wrath of a holy, righteous God delivered directly to the earth by seven high priests of heaven. One of the four beasts gave the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. Pay attention to this next phrase. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now again, wherever, we talked about this a while ago, wherever God is, creation itself shakes and trembles. We'll run into a scripture later on that says that the, the, the Ancient of Days will sit, the throne is set on the face of the earth, and the Ancient of Days will sit, and, it, and there's a phrase in there that says, whom heaven and earth have fled from his face. The creation itself cannot stand, cannot tolerate, cannot stay put together in the presence of God. Man can't live. No man has seen God as he is and lived. Nobody. We can't live. We can't tolerate it. We cannot tolerate. I mean, I mean, think about it. Over and over and over, the presence of God has been described as, as stormy, thundering, lightning, hail, storms, all, noise. All these things are going on. It's, it's, it's controlled chaos all the time. If you want to spend forever, eternity forever in heaven, uh, you know, in a quiet place, sitting on a quiet creek bank, you know, looking at flowers, you're going to the wrong place, my friend, because heaven is nothing. It's not quiet. There's nothing about heaven that's going to be quiet. It, all these things, all these activities are going on all the time. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here that, 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 that referring to this. Psalms chapter 18, verse 6 through 13 says this, In my distress I called upon the Lord. I called upon God and cried unto my God. And he heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind 
He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds in the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Wherever God is, there's activity, there's things going on. I read these scriptures like this, and, 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 and I chuckle at these people that I hear. I see these things on Facebook all the time. I hear people talking about them in casual conversation, you know, about I'm going to run, and when I see Jesus, I'm going to run up to him, and I'm going to wrap my arms around him and hug him, and, and God is, you know, my big old papa on the throne, and I'm just going to crawl up in it. I just want to crawl up in his lap and curl up in a little ball and go to sleep and just feel safe and protected, and that's all just hogwash. That's all just garbage. There's not, listen friend, I hate to bust your bubble, but there's not one single scripture, not one single scripture in the Bible that says that, that when we meet Jesus, when we leave here and meet Jesus, that we're going to be able to wrap our arms around him and hug him. Not once in nine. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I stand on the literal interpretation of the Bible. I interpret the Bible literally. I literally interpret the Bible literally. And one of my friends posted something on Facebook yesterday, and, and the word literal, interpreting the Bible literal, word, the word literal was used in that probably a hundred times, and I loved it. <laughs> because you can't, you can't say that enough. It is a literal interpretation of the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that nobody is ever going to be able to hug Jesus, but I am telling you, there's not one scripture in there that lets us know that it's okay to wrap our arms around him when we meet him. Not one. John laid on his breast. But like I said, Daniel and John are the only two people in the, in the whole Bible that are referred to as beloved. The only two people, John the Revelator and Daniel the Revelator, if you will. Both of them are Revelators. But I'm telling you, this, this whole idea of, you know, God's a big old papa and you can sit on his knee and, and Steve Hess used to say, sit on his knee and pull on his beard. No, that's, that's hogwash, people. That is hogwash. God is an awesome, righteous, holy, sovereign God. And even in our, even in our glorified state, it's not going to be. It's not going to be what we think. It's not going to be anything like what we think. Nothing. Read these scriptures. Exodus chapter forty, verses thirty-four and thirty-five says, "Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because of the cloud that abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Same thing when Solomon in the temple." 2 Chronicles 5, chapter 13 and 14. It came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. They couldn't even stand up in the presence of a cloud because of the holiness and the righteousness of God that abode in that cloud and rested in Him. Moses couldn't stand in the presence of the tabernacle. Now, verse 8, as I pointed out, it says, And the temple was filled with smoke. This is the temple in heaven. And from, his, from the glory of God and from His power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, what this is referring to, again, here we are at one of those crossroads where I'm referring to the WKW version of the King James Bible. This is, what I, this is my opinion here. No man was able to enter into the temple. God was alone. These last seven plagues, uh, you, you, have to, you have to grasp the power and, and the essence of what, the, what God is trying to tell us through His Word. And He's speaking these great and mighty words and speaking of these powerful things and these powerful times. And He's, and he's given us these very overpowering images of the things that are going on. 
knowing full well that we have to use our imaginations to try to see this. But, but what he's trying to say here is this is serious, serious business. Up until this point, all these things that have come on the earth are, are, are awful. They're horrible. Every single one of them, they're all horrible and awful. And every single one of them should have caused the repentance and the turning of every single man's heart. But it does not. Put yourself in God's position. Up until this point now, he's, he's done all these things that come on the earth and still men curse him. Still men mock him. Still men scoff at him. He says they're day and night now. I mean, just think of the garbage that's in the world now, the atheists and, and, and the abortionists and all the things that are happening, the murders and the, and the bloodthirstiness and all the things that are going on all over the earth. And he, ha and he has to take that. He has to absorb that into his being. He has to face that because he's had a time plan that's put in place, knowing full well that these things are going to come about. But here he's saying, right here he's saying, this is the last, this is it. This is the last seven. This is the worst of it all. This is, this, this is the worst ones. And he, he sends these special vials of wrath by these seven heavenly uh, uh, high priests and gets them and puts them on the face of the earth and he banishes everybody from the temple so he can be alone. Because this is, this, this is the power of him. He, don't, he, don't, he wants to be alone. He, he's, 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 think of Jesus. How often Jesus just couldn't take any more. He just couldn't take it. And he went off to a place several times in the Bible to describe Jesus going off by himself or going off with Peter, James, and John or just, just, just taking a minute because it's just it's overwhelming. It's overpowering the things that he was dealing with, the spirits and the trouble that was on the face of the earth, knowing people's minds, knowing people's hearts, walking. I mean, imagine Christ walking in a, through a crowd of people and knowing what every single one of them are thinking. And he has to walk through that. He kept his mouth shut in front of Pilate. But how many days and nights did he spend sitting among crowds of people who were hating him in his mind? And he knew it. It, it, just, it overwhelms him. And th this is it. This is the same. In my mind, this is what that represents. No man could enter the temple until this is over with. God, he wanted to be alone. This was it. He's at the end of his rope. Because at the end of this, at the end of the seven vials, he proclaims the same thing as Christ did on the cross. It is done. It is finished. And it's a time that he needs to be by himself. Because think about what he's doing. He's bringing death and destruction on the creation that he created for man who he loved. And he's bringing about death and destruction on his children that he created, that he loves. And this is the final destruction. This is the final devastation of it all. This is the final seven things in his wrath. And he wants to be alone when he does that. He wants to be all by himself. It's just, I could be wrong about that. But somehow I just don't think I am. <clears throat> That's chapter 15 of the book of Revelation. Next week we will see these vials put into place. We'll see these wrath come to fruition. And the things that come on the earth. Until then... Continue praying for me, and I'll continue praying for you. Again, as always, I thank you for watching. I thank you for sharing, and I hope through this study that God is blessing you somehow, that, that somehow He's bringing to you a, a deeper and a, and a more perfect relationship between you and Him, because in the end, that's what it's about. It's about you and God. It's about you and Christ. It's about the relationship between you and I and Him. We have nothing to do with it. It's all about Him. It's all for Him, by Him, and about Him. Um, <clears throat> until next week, thank you for watching, and God bless you greatly.